So the indie hit Titan Souls was published by Devolver Digital in 2015 to much critical acclaim. Titan Souls was conceptualized, developed, and published on major platforms in less than a year, a huge feat for the two-person development team over at Acid Nerve. It's a success story, and one that allowed Acid Nerve to push forward with new developmental ideas. One of those ideas grew into this year's brand new hit, Death's Door, the latest from Devolver and Acid Nerve. And so far, summer's big smash indie hit. Hey everyone, and welcome back to another episode of The Completionist, where we don't just beat the games, we complete them. Even though it only just came out, Death's Door is garnering critical attention and a lot of love. It seems like every few months, maybe once or twice a year, an indie game comes along that takes the world by storm. Death's Door is absolutely one of those games. I love featuring indie games here on the channel, but I rarely get to do so nowadays based on the whims of the almighty YouTube algorithm, New Game Plus aside. But hey, today, let's shuck the mold and talk about this breakout hit together. And hey, if you want more indie games on the channel, please like this video and let me know in the comments down below because there are so many games I want to talk about that I feel like YouTube is not the place to share them. So hey, with that said, today, we're going to complete Death's Door. Let's begin. Yes! Sometimes the reason one indie game takes off over another is inscrutable. Some games are amazing, but still don't find an audience until years after their release. But with Death's Door, that is not the case at all. This isometric, atmospheric, finely tuned action game has been blowing up on Xbox and Steam, and it only just came out a week or two ago. And it's easy to see why. Death's Door takes a few simple ideas and executes them perfectly. It's a game that feels purposeful, pointed, and sharp. Developer Acid Nerve also created the extremely focused Titan Souls, and though Death's Door is similarly focused in its ideas and design philosophy, it's a much more ambitious game. Rather than the pixel art, one-hit kill boss gauntlet that made up Titan Souls, Death's Door takes inspiration from other isometric action and puzzle games and puts its own spin on them. Death's Door begins in an otherworldly train station. Our protagonist emerges into a black and white world, a broken down bureaucracy where one of their first days, possibly, as a reaper of souls, meets with some unexpected results. After meeting some office mates, my little crow was sent out into the mortal world to collect a soul assigned to them. However, just when I was about to collect the soul and bring it back to headquarters, an older, grizzled crow stole the soul and sent it through a different sealed door. This door is impossible to open without the energy from three giant souls. So it's off into the world to battle enemies, find what I need, and unravel just why this old crow wanted to steal my assigned soul in the first place. The narrative is simple at first, but this is a game that absolutely shines in the details. At every turn, I found myself uncovering deeper mysteries about my job as a reaper, or meeting hilarious and intriguing new side characters. The world that's been built here is fantastic, like something out of a Neil Gaiman fantasy story. Characters are wry, witty, and instantly iconic. Who couldn't fall in love with Agatha the Typist five seconds after meeting her? Who couldn't meet my man Pothead and not determine that he's awesome? Also, do you think he and the Onion Knight from Dark Souls are pals? I think they're pals. I think the reason why that Death's Door is striking a chord right now with many is that it isn't afraid to take inspiration from other games and do something different with said inspiration. There is intense combat featuring dodge rolls and melee strikes similar to that of Hyperlight Drifter or Hades. There's a lot of old school Zelda in this game too, 
particularly in the rudimentary puzzle solving and item based exploration, which locks certain areas behind unlockable abilities. There is even the teeniest bit of souls like here in how areas loop back around each other and require a little exploration to find brand new shortcuts. If this sounds like a delightful smorgasbord so far, then buckle up kiddos because it gets better from here. I'll get back to gameplay in a second, but I want to take a minute to gush about the aesthetics of Death's Door. The monochromatic intro brought me right into a world of intrigue, but exploring the rest of the game helped me appreciate the contrast the developers were going for. Our little crow person is constantly going back and forth between the mortal world and that of the Reapers, and the vibes between those two realms couldn't be more different. The Reaper office is stifling, somehow feeling musty and ageless. The Reapers may be an institution here, but the headquarters feels like it's in need of a makeover. Something is clearly not right, and it's all conveyed with just a little bit of flavor text and a whole lot of atmosphere. Part of why I couldn't stop smiling as I played this game is the absolutely gorgeous soundtrack. David Fenn is not only the game's producer and sound designer, he's the composer as well, and he kills it here. The entire soundscape feels composed and purposeful, and seeing environments line up with musical choices is awesome. Special shout outs to the Estate of the Urn Witch theme and the Underground Laboratory theme. Two wonderful pieces of music that make each area feel unique and special. Each piece of music felt much more powerful because going back to the quiet and somber Reaper headquarters was such a contrast. For a game focused on the end point of life, Death's Door is surprisingly lighthearted. I was reminded of the side characters in Hollow Knight and how NPCs have side quests and dialogue that make them feel distinct. There are the office crows, but there are also several other characters out in the world who made me chuckle or even laugh out loud. I especially enjoyed meeting Jefferson, a squid who basically ratatouille's a person into cooking, all the while pretending that this is perfectly normal behavior. The office setting is wonderful, and I actually wish there were more machinations to be involved with here. I would love to see more of the day-to-day -day of what these crows get up to, watching office politics unfold as the big boss is nowhere to be found, and more and more things fall apart every day. But this is not a simulation game. The Office Death Crow Edition. It's an action game. Completing this game asked a lot of me, and I'm so glad that it did. Death's Door is more than just pretty to look at and listen to. It's the tight-ass gameplay that makes it pop. Acid Nerve wears their inspiration out on their sleeves, but the completion process helps this game stand tall on its own. The big main thing I was tasked with was finding and collecting the three giant souls, of course that being the plot of the game. That meant I essentially had to find and defeat three big bad bosses, each one more challenging than the last. But this is not a boss rush game, to be clear. I had to explore environments, finding and defeating enemies along the way, and for the sake of completion, I scoured the world for secrets and collectibles. But the way I played this game is probably probably different from how, well, anyone else will. I've talked before about how when I'm about to complete a new game, I do a little bit of homework about what I'm going to do and what that will entail. So after turning the game on for the very first time and running around the world to get a feel of movement, I went to check out the list of Steam achievements. One of them caught my eye immediately, the Academy of Umbrellas achievement, which required me to finish the entire game using only the umbrella as my weapon doesn't sound so bad until you look at the actual stats of the umbrella. Essentially, it's a nerf, a weapon weaker than the default sword and every other weapon I would eventually find in the game. Since I generally try to complete a game in as few as playthroughs as possible, I knew that if I wanted to earn this achievement right away, I'd have to start off with this umbrella and never switch weapons, which would ultimately change my entire ability to experience this game. And truthfully, even though I was limiting myself to one weapon during my first playthrough, I was fine doing this. Because I play a lot of damn video games, I don't mind when a game like this makes itself a little more difficult for the sake of an achievement. It's a great way to introduce a new hard mode to the player without an actual difficulty setting adjustment. Everything else stayed exactly the same, I was simply using a less powerful weapon than the ones I would inevitably find during normal gameplay. Since my attacks were less powerful than they would normally be, I was forced to, as they say, get good at death's door right away. 
I had to learn the intricacies of my dodge roll and the exact range and speed of my attacks. Enemies took a lot longer to kill, so I had to take greater care not to take damage as they endured my assault. Umbrella only on my first one was probably the most unconventional way to complete this game. I don't think I'd recommend completing Death's Door this way, because after I earned this Steam achievement, I experimented with some of the other weapons I had found during my journey, and all of them are all awesome. The umbrella is a handicap, and I probably would have had even more fun by playing with different weapons as I found them rather than after I'd already beaten the game. As far as earning the actual giant souls goes, let me confirm that the boss fights are incredible, and I wanted more and more of them. Seems like with different giant souls, everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. Each character, all of them extremely well written, has their own issues with the Crow Reapers and will do everything they can to avoid having their souls taken and being laid to rest. Fighting my way to the bosses was incredibly satisfying, and actually battling them is a reward on their own. After much exploration and many tough battles, I learned new magic skills until I had all four. The bow and arrow is a great way for quick combat. The fireball helped me solve a ton of puzzles. Bombs opened up the walls I couldn't break through previously. And of course, the hookshot is a hookshot, which helped me cross gaps I couldn't get to before. Why my little crow couldn't simply fly over these obstacles is a question for another time. Death's Door is proudly advertised as not a roguelike, and it's clear the developers put some thought into the level design. In a lot of ways, playing and completing this game feels like a back-to-basics experience in a good way. Unlocking a door or letting down a ladder is permanent, like the shortcuts in Dark Souls or Bloodborne. But unlike those games, players don't lose anything when they fall in combat. I didn't have to collect my souls by defeating the enemies that had killed me. I simply progressed forward. And this was a huge relief and let me enjoy the game even more. This especially mattered for completion because I had to purchase all of the combat upgrades at a cost of at least 17,200 souls, which I would exchange at the soul vault back in the office. Defeating most basic enemies earned me two or three points at a time, and even the mini bosses didn't net me very many points altogether. Death's Door isn't a very grind-friendly game. Finding masses of souls in secret areas turned out to be the best way to level up, but those are far and few between. The more I experienced, the more I appreciated the Zelda influence. I started off with a small health bar and magic meter. I came across shrines where I could find out what are essentially pieces of heart. Finding all 16 of them earned me extra hit points and spell slots. But Death's Door is surprisingly light on these shrines, and I was able to completely beat the game in all of the boss fights without upgrading my health really. Even for those dedicated to exploration, earning an extra hit point or spell slot feels like a real achievement because I had to go out of my way to do so. The way healing is approached in a combat-heavy game like this can make or break the experience. Death's Door handles this very uniquely. Throughout my journey, I found life seeds that I could plant in these big flower pots. Each pot sprouts a healing flower that heals for full health, but that flower can only be picked up once per area, and they regrow upon my character's death or entering and exiting the area. Since there's an achievement for finding and planting all 50 life seeds, I always felt like I had a secret stash of health nearby that I could scurry off to whenever I needed to. It feels innovative. Instead of carrying potions or using up a spell slot to heal, I had to go out of my way to backtrack to a healing point. Death's Door asked me to make an active choice to go back and heal or push through the pain to see how good I could be. Every aspect of combat, world building, and exploration feels really well thought out. Even the simple act of filling the magic meter by landing a hit on an enemy or object is wonderful because it forces the player to change up their fighting style moment to moment. Experiencing the broad strokes of this game is magnificent and made me feel both nostalgic for the past games of this style and also excited for their future. Death's Door also shines in the small details and that's when it takes it to another level. Death's Door is packed full of small yet impressive details, from well-written character moments, to animations, to cleverly designed gameplay. I couldn't stop smiling despite how grim this world was. These details help make the game stand out and are one more reason it's a smash hit. Seeing my little crow bob and tilt its head was incredibly adorable. The way the Lord of Door sips from his world's best Lord mug made me laugh out loud. Every time I did a dang dodge roll, a few feathers would fly off. And of course, there's the now infamous interactive UI. 
If I had sliced a sign in half with my dull purple umbrella, from then on, I could only read half the sign. Even though I mastered combat pretty early on, there were several battles that had me biting my nails. Earning magic spells required me to basically defeat waves of increasingly tough enemy combinations, and upgrading them forced me to battle a deadly boss in hidden locations. These upgrades are tough to track down, but if you're going down the Steam Achievement Checklist, you have to do these fights. Like I said though, I found the combat to be really enjoyable, even with just a severely underpowered umbrella. There is a fair amount of backtracking to be had in Death's Door, and interestingly, no map to help the players. Not only did I have to keep track of where I planted life seeds and what shrines I had passed by because I didn't have the right tool to reach them, I also had to scour areas for shiny things the game's main collectible. Now we all know that crows and ravens love to collect shiny things and stash them away, and it's the same here, art reflecting nature. So I actually got word that the Corvid family, which includes Blue Jays, don't actually have a preference for shiny things over other objects. My entire world just is kind of falling apart now. One thing I really loved is that for every shiny thing I collected, there was an actual representation of that thing in game. Instead of just a menu screen full of stuff, I had to go to a desk and see all 24 of the trinkets and baubles that I had found throughout my playthrough. It isn't much, but there is something really satisfying to me about when collectibles actually show up in the game versus just a checklist. The post game felt almost like a whole new experience because I actually had the chance to experiment with some different weapons. I loved the big chunky greatsword, but I also appreciated that the rogue daggers are basically one long tribute to Eileen the Crow from Bloodborne. Death's Door has one final surprise up its sleeve. After beating the final boss and letting those credits roll, you will be treated to a short post credit scene showing off a shiny thing being left behind by the final boss. Go pick it up and you will find a key. Now this key unlocks a bell tower which, once rung, transforms the world into a night version of itself. Without getting too spoilery, this adds a bunch more to the game. You've got additional encounters, more puzzles to solve, and achievements to get. It all culminates with you earning the true ending. It's a surprisingly large post game for a game of this size. I constantly felt like I was earning things as I crossed them off Steam achievements, and honestly the only thing that really tripped me up was maxing out my abilities since grinding for souls is really hard to do in this game. I filled out 20 slots total, from strength to dexterity to magic. There aren't any achievements or bonuses tied to maxing out everything, but I feel like I should just in case. For as densely packed as Death's Door is, and with great combat and satisfying collectibles, it's also a short experience. I completed this game in about 15 hours from start to finish. There is definitely backtracking, but not as much as you might anticipate. Earning all 24 achievements was a tough task, but also an incredibly satisfactory one. Bosses are memorable and really unique, and I would love to see more stories told in the universe of Death's Door. Death's Door is such a great time. The game never holds your hand, but it also doesn't demand too much of the player. It's tough, but nowhere near overwhelming. Rather than punishing players with difficulty spikes or really obtuse puzzles, I felt like I was constantly progressing. The completion process was similarly satisfying, always making me feel like I was earning something cool for my efforts. There's a real aura of mystery in the world, and even something as simple as going around a corner that I didn't think was accessible and then finding a shrine that felt special. Death's Door didn't exactly come out of nowhere by any means, but it deserves the spotlight today that it's getting. So, with that in mind guys, I give this game my completionist rating of Complete It. Complete It!